Hey, this is Jason. We just did Digging In with Matt Rosenthal. Had a blast. Hope you watch us. We uh, covered my life from uh, back in the day, television, radio, sports, fun, to the adult stuff that I'm doing now uh, that I think would be helpful. So you got to tune in. All right, everybody, welcome back to Digging In with Matt Rosenthal. I have an awesome guest today, Jason Salatkin. And let me tell you something, this guy is gonna have some stories to tell about <laughs> finance. Actually, we're gonna talk about the sports casting. All right. The sports casting gig. But um, it's timely. It's timely because there's a lot going on in finance. There's a lot going on for people are confused. And we're talking war, we're talking COVID, we're talking inflation, supply chain issues. So. Welcome aboard. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I think that there's, there's just some like amazing perspectives that you're going to share. In fact, you have to share some amazing perspectives. That's the rule. That's, That's rule what I one. plan on doing. That's what I'm here for. Um, drink slow. Stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> cheers. You know, do a quick little cheers. This is the last show. Of the, last show of the day. Market's closed, just for the record. Okay. So in other words, he will not be trading with anybody's money right now. That's right. And no contracts are binding. That's right. Um, so listen, take me back. So right now we know what you're doing. I mean, you're doing a lot in finance. You're involved in insurance. Uh, you're successful. Um, you've built something big from something relatively, um, I guess it was a family business, something smaller. Before we get into that, you're one of the few Florida natives. So take me back to kind of like your childhood and a little bit of the journey. Sure. <laughs> it is rare to meet a Florida native. Um, but we do exist. My parents, both born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, made a decision back in 1972 to leave everything behind. It was a big leap of faith. And they moved down to South Florida the year my older brother was born. And uh, I came along a few years later. So grew up in Hollywood, Florida, born and raised. Always took for granted, great weather. Uh, beaches, palm trees, um, still do. I still watch people shoveling snow on the on the news and shake my head. And I'm just very grateful that that I grew up in a in a place like this. Went to school down here, college at the University of Miami. Big hurricane. Um, as a kid, I had a very strong goal and passion. You mentioned, which was believe it or not, to become a sports broadcaster. I knew I would not be the uh, center fielder for the Mets or <laughs> starting you know center for the so. Knicks. <laughs> I came to that self-realization very quickly, but always loved sports and just got drawn into um, that craft, you know, which is, it was unique. But I was the one kid that all my friends looked at as the one who knew what he wanted to do and had a path. And that's what I pursued. College was great for me. You really knew it. What's that? Like you knew. Yeah. Just oh, like, yeah. Yeah. I you mean, just love sports in general, like all sports. Yeah. I mean, did you play sports? I played. I was decent. Okay. <laughs> um, but this this was totally different. This was just show me a microphone and and um, and I knew that's that's what I wanted to do. Um, it was a passion of mine. So high school, I was announcing the high school baseball games. I had my karaoke machine. I dragged out to the field. Um, college all through four years, covered the hurricanes on the student radio station, traveled the country. We raised money. We ran it like a business. Um, trips to Hawaii and California, all over the country. Great experience. Through those relationships, I was able to, to take it into um, professional life. So that's how it all started. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty interesting <laughs> that you knew that. And then you actually you just did it. So, yeah, I mean, so, you just went for it. And the benefit of that, honestly, was being exposed to the business from an early age. So a lot of things may seem one way from a distance, superficially, um, especially in the entertainment world. You see the finished product, but you don't necessarily see how the sausage is made. Like the work that's going into it. The what time. goes on behind the scenes and how the industry really is. Now um, you got to elaborate. <laughs> How's the industry? So 
if I was ever brought back to speak to young, aspiring broadcasters, I would say, yes, it's important to work hard. And yes, it's important to have talent. But what perhaps is most important is that you have this relentless attitude to be in the face of anybody and everybody who can advance your career. And don't ever assume that talent will win out because it will only get you so far. Um, and in retrospect, I wish somebody had taught me that um, because I never doubted talent and ability, but I did have a certain sense of, I don't want to say entitlement, but a sense that talent would carry you through. And truth of the matter is you have to meet the right person at the right time and you have to have some luck involved unless you're born into it. <laughs> some people, nepotism does exist. Uh, but for everybody else, it's it's a tough kind of confluence of factors that have to line up. And then if you are successful, you have to realize that this is typically an industry that requires you to go from city to city, market to market, job to job. And then I realized if I'm really fulfilling this dream that I have, I'm in a different city every weekend. If I'm calling the NFL for NBC or ESPN, I'm traveling on Thursdays, I'm meeting with the teams on Fridays, I'm calling a game on Saturday or Sunday, which sounds wonderful and glamorous, but if you want to be a husband and a father and you want to build roots in a community, it's extremely difficult. And finally, I will say it's very hard to be in control of your own journey if you're not the boss. <laughs> you're always beholden <laughs> to somebody lot. in a corner office yeah, deciding yeah. your fate. That's a lot. You know, there's, a, there's two, one word that you said that was interesting, which is relentless. Actually, there's a book. You know Tim Grover? Yes. Tim Grover, yes. The, uh, he was Michael Jordan's a trainer. trainer. Wrote and a Dwayne book Wade. Yeah, called Chicago. Relentless. Yeah. Powerful book. But that one word, I mean, that word alone, it, it says everything. Um, and I'm glad you said it because that, I'm sure, ties into the rest of your story. I mean, to be successful, you've got to have that. Yep. And I'm not even sure you can teach it to people. It's hard to, to teach people how to be committed and disciplined and relentless and do all the hard work. Who taught you? Were your parents, were your parents really hard workers? They were, but I think a lot of it is innate. I think that you're born with the ingredients <laughs> and then you can be shaped and molded by others. But I think you come out the way you are and then you just have to make the most out of it. So yes, you could have mentors and role models, and certainly I had great ones, but I was a student, you know, as an example, and it wasn't because I was trying to please anybody. I just hated the feeling of failure. I did not accept in school that I wasn't going to achieve, that I wasn't gonna get the best grade, the best GPA, and I didn't do it for anybody other than my own self-satisfaction. I certainly didn't need it to be a sportscaster. <laughs> True. <laughs> so Tell that's just who you are. What did, what, what did your dad do at the time for a living when you were a kid? When I was a kid, my father was a self-made man. He had ups and downs, he had struggles. Um, I don't remember hardship at all. I remember times where relative to others in the community, we didn't have. <laughs> um, it's all relative. Like that, everything is always relative. You know, there was a time where I wanted to go to the ball game and we couldn't afford tickets. There was a time where my mom was cutting my hair because we couldn't afford a haircut and time when we had to go to the flea market to get sneakers. But I don't remember that being hardship. That was never suffering for us. It was never struggle. Um, my father had failures until he found his successes and he was a hard worker and driven and you know, still is a role model to me. And um, he helped build the business that I'm now working in. So I think it's a great story. It is a great story. And it's, it's some, those are, so you said role model. So there, there is, I agree with you, some things you're born with and there's some things that you're exposed to. And it's almost like you don't realize it. You're, I can feel as you're talking, like you're serious. <laughs> I mean, you are serious. You're a fun guy, but you're serious about what you're saying. Yeah. And when you just said, um, 
how you feel about basically succeeding. And it's just about you against yourself. That's powerful. That's not common. That's like, that's like a unicorn type of, you know, there's very few people. I mean, where you and I live, there are a lot of people <laughs> like that, but it's not typical. Right. It's, it's, it's not always, unusual. It's not always, um, I'm not the type of person that thought I could fake my way to success. And I think where we live, yes, there's a tremendous amount of um, backing into fortune mm -hmm. <laughs> or being born into fortune. Um, but if you scratch below the surface, you may not see a lot of depth there. Yeah. Uh, I'm foundational. Yeah, sure. I believe in ground up. And it was a long road. So, yeah. So, and thanks for establishing like that you didn't just have things handed to you. Right. So it was, there was, there was a road Like you traveled the road. So this is cool. This is fun. What you, what you just talked about, like, I mean, very few people get to do what you've done, um, in terms of entertainment, yeah. but you turned it into, so you moved on from college and then turned it into something else. So how did that transition? So through the experience and meeting people and being exposed to the business from a young age, I was somebody who was able to live my dream. Um, on the air, television, radio, from calling the Miami Heat games, courtside, center court, crazy. interviewing all That's the awesome. top players, Kobe yeah. Bryant, Michael yeah. Jordan, um, hiring an agent, getting hired to do the Olympics yeah. in Salt Lake City. I was on the tra trajectory, but there were a few, uh, let's say, roadblocks along the way that had nothing to do with my ability that made me realize that um, I always knew if, if I was going to sustain this career long term, I didn't want to be the guy 45, 50 years old with a family fired with nowhere to go. It's a simple supply and demand issue where the demand for jobs is always through the roof, the supply not so much. It's not like you're a banker, you get fired by bank A, you go across the street and get a job at bank B. I didn't want to be the one without a place to turn. So I knew if I didn't create a brand for myself quickly, um, where I could call the shots and say, you know what, you don't want me, this next, next network will want me and I'm fine going over there. But to get there, you got to have some breaks along the way. There were a few situations that um, opportunities were available to me that somebody decided I couldn't have. And it still burns me today. Really? It still burns me today. Where situations where I would love to go back and ask, why did that happen? I, you know, it's a sequence of events. You said no. And to this day, maybe 20, 25 years later, I still don't know why. But I did learn that nobody is going to determine my fate moving forward. So ultimately, I left the wait, career. Wait, what age were you at this point? 20s. Okay. I mean, I was. It's a valuable lesson. I was doing Heat games, <laughs> yeah. 23, 24, interviewing, you know, Pat Riley before every game. Um, right around the time I got married, maybe 28, 29, I was done. And. Uh, very conscious decision. Yeah. Very well thought out decision. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, literally, to be a good decision. I literally, literally told my boss that I was quitting my job, taking my two weeks honeymoon vacation and could never tell him the reason why, because I was sworn to secrecy um, not to. Didn't want to burn any bridges with any of the teams or organizations I was working with. You couldn't tell him why you were leaving? Yeah. Is it still a secret? It's still a secret. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about it. Let's just say that, um, yeah, I'm a man of my word. <laughs> still can't talk about it. Okay. Let's just say I had an opportunity that was a very high profile opportunity that I had to be released by my boss to take at 27, 28 years old. And my boss did not let me go. And the organization said, if he doesn't let you go, you can't tell them that we wanted you for that job because we don't want to burn any bridges with him. And so instead of telling him um, what I thought about him and the fact that he was stonewalling my career. Intentionally. 
He, he didn't, knew he didn't want to leave. He didn't want to let me go from that job to take a better job. So I said, I'm leaving. He never told him why. Okay. So when you left, did, could you go to the other job? No. So that was, I needed his blessing to take that other job. Oh, wow. So you had to leave the industry. I did multiple times. <laughs> wait, wait. So you, you came back? Yeah, I came back a couple times and ultimately I left for good. Um, 2004. Okay. And went to work uh, for a few years in investment real estate. Work with my father in law. Down here in 2004, the real estate market is very similar to what it is right now. Yeah, it was headed for, uh, it was, it was almost peaking. It was. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wanted in. Yeah. We made a lot of money. I helped him build that business, commercial real estate investment. And then 2008 happened and the world came to an end. So you had three years of knowing what it felt like. So you came in, it was strong, then it crashes, but then it was a phenomenal ride after that for people that stayed in. Right. How long did you stay in it? Well, 2008, the business fell apart and the world oh, fell apart. Over. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The values of the properties in the toilet. Um, so that was the first time I looked at the business that my father built with a real appreciation for what he had done. So I'm a guy who never had an interest growing up, wanted to do one thing completely unrelated, then worked somewhat related in the investment world. But our investors went from making three or four times on their investment to losing their investment. And so I looked at his business and I said, A, how on January 1st are you able to know that you can put the lights on and pay your bills? when the rest of the world is suffering the worst economy since the Great Depression. B, what are you doing for your clients who are investing where they are safe and they're not panicking in the midst of stock market going down 20, 30 percent? I guess I had some perspective. <laughs> I was a little more mature, now married with a kid. And it was the first time I looked at his business with a real appreciation for, um, I lived out my dream. I went into a second career, made a ton, lost everything. What can I do in the long term to put myself in position, um, you know, to take care of people and take care of my family? And that's what I've been doing ever since. Bring me back for a sec. So in, in 2004, so it sounds like you made a ton. Right for a couple of years, so it was you, quick. You you hadn't really felt any. And you hadn't. You didn't have to learn any big lessons about failure at that point. No, I'm not hearing that in the story. So no. yeah, no. but you hit the first one with that with that crash in the market. So do you remember how that felt? Like when you're in it, you were like, "Oh my god! Like what am I gonna do?" I saw it coming. It was like a locomotive. Um, we still had people interested in investing with us or purchasing our properties. But I remember calling the bank, trying to get financing, and it was getting more and more difficult. And I could see it starting to dry up until ultimately I was able to, through a very challenging um, job, refinance some properties, pull out some cash. And I knew right then and there the lights were turning off. That was it. You knew. I, I knew that was the last deal I could make. This was maybe were you 2007. Investing, you were investing in real estate personally at that point? Uh, that was a job. It wasn't my, we had other people's cash okay. into the deals to okay. purchase, remodel, reposition South Florida properties for sale in a very short period of time. It's like people who flip houses now. We were doing with office buildings and retail centers. Okay. So no personal exposure. No, but my, I didn't have any, <laughs> I didn't have investment money to put at stake. I was okay. living off my salary and trying to raise my family at that time. I'm still relatively young, but I had, nothing to, I had nothing to fall time. back on. That's a scary time. Yeah. What did you learn from that at that moment, right? You learned something that you still carry with you. For sure. What is it? Um, primarily, I learned that if you were going to be speculative with your money, you better make sure that you can afford to lose it. 
And our, de our deals were highly speculative, very aggressive. And so for those who were putting their net worth at stake, the lesson was um, you're being unreasonable and um, you, do not, you do not have a proper financial plan in place. Somebody, if not yourself, should be guiding you better to understand what you can risk. You took that away from that. Absolutely. Which is everything you're doing now. 100%. And that was really like, oh, wait, maybe. Save for a rainy day because it's mm -hmm. coming. Interesting. Risk management uh, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, never gets old. I mean, it's, it's everything. Yeah. It's not it's sexy. <laughs> it's not. It's not. But it's at the center of every single choice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, if you, can, you can go all in on Bitcoin and you might time it right. Or you can chip away at that and everything else. It's fascinating to me how many people have asked me about Bitcoin. I'm not going to ask you. Or SPACs or AMC, meme stocks. It's as if, especially younger people, it's as if they woke up and what they're presented with is revolutionary and the only way to do things. And that everything else that people like me have learned and been trained on is now obsolete. It's out the window. The past hundred years <laughs> don't make a difference. History doesn't matter. You how, many, how many cryptocurrencies and how many types of, of companies can you invest in? Which is the right one? Has anybody really asked what this is and what the necessity is and the utility of it and the value of it moving forward is? It's, or the profits of the business? There, there aren't any. It's an adrenaline it's rush. You can't it's, see an, it. it's an ADD, yeah. adrenaline rush, FOMO, all of these things yeah. that this generation lives by seems to be what's guiding their financial planning, which to me is a joke. All right, we might get back there. Hold on. <laughs> so we do not guide anybody into Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, re it wouldn't be reasonable to. You want to have fun with it? Just like you want to yes. put some money at risk, like the properties that we were presenting. Um, you want to put 5% of your portfolio in it, knowing you can afford to lose it, have at it. I'm glad you said that because that some people can afford to do that. You can afford to take a little bit of a risk and the upside is huge. You put 5% and if you have a decent portfolio, I mean, you could 10x that. Absolutely. Pretty easily. Go happen. for it. By all means. And you can... You can go the other direction just as quickly. <laughs> right. Um, wow. That's a really interesting. Okay. So so now you have, oh, uh, I guess, 08, 09, 10. That all happens. And now you're into the next chapter. The right? next chapter is a pretty long chapter. I mean, a lot happens there. Absolutely. So take me through that. I had to put my head down. I was starting from scratch, really. Um, and... As much of a student as I was <laughs> and still am, it was a lot to learn to do this the right way. Um, started by getting my insurance licenses. Then I got my securities licenses. <clears throat> and then I decided to become a certified financial planner to further my education and get the credibility. Um, as somebody Big still deal. young, the most difficult thing I've ever yeah. done. And that's different far. than being a fiduciary, right? If you become a CFP, a certified financial planner, you are by degree, by license, a fiduciary. Automatically. Okay. There are other ways that I serve as a fiduciary, but I've got it, I've got it all covered. <laughs> Explain that though, because most people that are gonna see this have no idea what I just asked you. Sure. Fiduciary, and it matters. You know, it almost seems like it should be intuitive that the person that you're trusting with your money is working solely on your behalf. Unfortunately, it's not. And I think in one way it helps because it separates me from the pack, the fact that I am one. On the other hand, it makes it very difficult for people to trust people like me because those who don't act in your best interest have given people like me a bad name in the industry. You There's can, a lot of people like that. It's very hard to trust. I said to me, you got to trust the doctor and at some point, you probably want to trust somebody like me. And what's more important than your health and your wealth? Not much. 
That's, that's great. And so how do you know who the right person is? If God forbid you have a diagnosis, you want the very best doctor. At some point, you're gonna to have to take a leap of faith. As much as their credentials look right, they have the right degrees, somebody refers you, you're gonna to have to take a leap of faith. Same thing with what I do. So the fact that I'm a fiduciary, not driven by commissions, not driven by my own greed. Um, for instance, when we manage money, we charge a fee that's a percentage of your account. We are inherently motivated to see the account increase in size because we're getting a piece right. of that. Right. Um, others are trying to trade your account, tell you the hot stock, tell you the hot bond, buy and sell to earn a commission off the transaction. That's the way things used to be done. It's not the way we do business anymore. So it's a long game. Has to be. It's all relationships. It's retention. We're dealing with second and third generation of clients now. We always take the approach that we're in it for the long term. We're never looking for a short term profit. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be in a business with a company that's always taken that approach with, with the long game in mind. So you got the certifications a lot. Okay. You have a lot of, of uh, and simultaneously, I'm out there on the street trying to build relationships, doing networking groups, hosting networking lunches at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast, you know, um, Hope, hoping to build trust. People <laughs> yeah. get to know you. They trust yeah. you. Knowing that it's a Those long sales cycle. The certifications, I mean, it's, it's invaluable to have all that. But it, at the end of the day, is it not relationship building? 100%. Trust. And people, they can know you have that, and that's important. But the feeling, trust is a feeling. It's something you get from, from just being around somebody, from getting to know them. So you're also a salesman. <laughs> we all are. Everybody has to sell. And I mean salesman in the, in the best way. 100%. You want to help people. But to do that, you have to persuade them to trust you. It's an interesting thing. You're right. And once you get that, the rest is easy because that's where your profession is. Like you just, you know what to do. So maybe you're selling without people knowing they're being sold. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it's uh, it's a combination of everything. You have to be able to market yourself. You have to be able to yeah. get in front of people, but you got to have the goods, you know, you got to have something to back it up. Now, when you, when you got into that, that business, you didn't, you didn't have much to back it up. No. So how did you convince people to, to work with you, even with the certifications? It's in the very background? difficult because my partners in the business who had the experience simply wanted me to open the door. It and then bring them the deals? Correct. It was very difficult, even if I could participate in the act. I hated it. <laughs> you hated yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, you <laughs> you wanted a, to control the outcome. A bit of a control freak. <laughs> yeah, it was very I difficult for me. Yeah, you do, 100%. Um, not my personality to just hand something off. Also because the quality, you care about the outcome and you care about the people. So and handing it off, these people trusted you to come in the door, but if you hand it off, it's kind they, of a, they may kind not of, get the experience you want. Yeah, I didn't it's like the of idea of a, of a bait and switch. <laughs> I thought I was working with you. No, honestly, I, I didn't like the idea of losing control of the relationship of the idea share was very difficult for me. And so what I ultimately got to be comfortable with was being involved with a relationship, not walking away, but working with those who might have had more experience in a particular um, relationship. So I had to get to that point. You did a good job of building relationships. You, you brought people in and ultimately you built your own, your own business. And you did you did well. The reason I'm go I'm going into this background on you and, and what's going on now. It requires people who are choosing to work with somebody. This isn't about you know, selling you and your service. This is about you and I sharing with people that might watch this. With everything that's going on, this is an important time to have strategic advisors, people that you can trust, because a lot of things are about to happen. Yeah. This is March of 2022. A lot of things are about to happen. We don't know what's going to happen, 
But if you're not paying attention to your money and if you don't have somebody that's like a partner, right. a partner, you could have a really bad outcome and look back five years from now and be like, oh my God, like what did I do? So what do you see? What do you think? I know you can't predict the future, but like I said before, COVID, inflation, supply chain issues, <laughs> um, post, God knows with, the, with this, the war with Ukraine, whatever's going to impact us, gas prices, like everything. Not financial advice question, but what should people begin to think about? That's the question. Well, when it comes to, there's a lot of fear right now for all, all the things you mentioned. And I'm going to throw something else out there which is just my gut. Um, I think there's a lot of borrowing going on. I think there's a credit bubble forming. It's the only thing that's logical to me when demand is high. And I'll get, I give the example of this. You talk about inflation. Some things are beyond our control. Supply chain issues, lack of supply, lack of potential energy sources, production of oil. Yes, it's intuitive, prices are gonna go up. Talk to me about a hotel room right now. It's spring break 2022. And what are the prices of hotel rooms right now? I went on a business trip last week to Orlando, not realizing it was spring break by Disney to meet a client. Wanted to book a hotel room for an overnight stay for meetings the next morning. The same trip we've made year after year to visit the same clients. And all of a sudden, hotel rooms are through the roof. Is there a scarcity? Is there a lack of hotel rooms? No. Is there strong demand? Absolutely. Have people been cooped up because of a pandemic, just waiting for a green light to get out there? Absolutely. How can they afford it? Government stimulus, done. People working? I'm not so sure <laughs> employers are clamoring for help and they're willing to pay you anything. So I can't find employees and I just hired three people and paid a premium for them. Okay. So it's an employee market, meaning that they're sitting back and waiting for the right opportunity. Where's all the money coming from to afford hotel rooms and trips and the price of goods? Credit. I'm they have concerned. to pay the bills eventually. And so if interest rates go up and your variable interest, you know, credit card interest rate goes up and you've been paying that minimum balance, thinking it wasn't going to change, it will change. And that goes up. And just like 2008 with those adjustable rate mortgages, when rates went up and people couldn't afford it, they lost their homes. I'm concerned that people are not going to be able to sustain their credit. That's just a concern. That's just another fear. But your question was, what should people do? And the answer think is, about, what should they think about? The answer is unique to you. There are headwinds, there are challenges. And so far this year, we're not magicians. We haven't avoided losses. What you need to think about is when it comes to investments, what is your time horizon? Do you need this money in the short term? Can you withstand losses because there will be a recovery to get this money where it needs to be? So, if you're older, if you don't have a humongous nest egg to live off of in retirement, you should not be invested in a way where all of these challenges will affect your ability to reach your retirement goal. If you're younger and you're just starting out, keep putting money into your retirement plan. Just keep going. It's and not ride it out. Write it out. You were buying in potentially at a low in a lot of places. So there's no magic bullet. There's no magic answer. Know your situation and make sure there's somebody partnering with you to tell you where you should be to get to your goal based on your assets, your liabilities, and your goals. And it, I think a big part of, of the way you position yourself is asset preservation. Yep. Right. So, I mean, it's a good segue <clears throat> into that that idea because everything goes in cycles. It's a boom bust. There, there's wars have happened before. Yep. What's happening is, is going to happen. It could be an opportunity, investment wise. I mean, things are going to come down. You know, and, and and rather than buying at one point in time, if you just keep averaging in and averaging in, I mean, I'm just guessing. You're, You're right. a professional. Hundred percent. I'm an IT guy. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> 
Yeah. And that's kind of what you're saying, right? It's so even though there's a lot of fear going on, you can't time the market. You can't time the market. Um, you know, it's foolish that's a big to time, lesson. Try and time the market. It's it's even somebody who loves control. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you can't, can't time control the market. The market. You... No. So the idea of you want to put money in the market, do it in segments. You know, average it out over a certain period of time, dollar cost average. But risk management is beyond investments. It's preparing for the unforeseen or unpredictable, just like, um, you know, you're hacked by a cyber like criminal. Cyber breach. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You That's almost predictable now. It's, it's almost a guarantee that it's gonna happen. It's happened to me. <laughs> so this is a little different, but there's four people on either side of these cameras that are in there that are young, right? Let's, let's talk to the, except for this guy over here, in their 20s, 20s, 30s. <laughs> Wait a second. What, what do we tell them in their 20s, early 30s? I mean, they got a long, a long horizon. And that's you know, a big part of the, this audience over time is going to be people that, that age. Should they really be thinking about fear right now? They should be thinking about principles and disciplines and building habits, understand cash flow, understand credit, understand debt. Um, those are all principles that are going to carry you through life. So you may not be able to save and invest. You know, you may not be able to get excited by the idea of a Bitcoin at this point. Um, but understand that you need to be very disciplined in your spending. You need to understand that at some point you do need to start saving. You need to understand that insurance is important. And I will tell you the opportunity for me was so great in 2008 because there aren't enough people like me that develop the skills and the training and the understanding because it's never taught to us. <laughs> Nothing is taught to us. There's so much in that's school, taught to us. It's Robert Kiyosaki 101, right? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. They don't teach us anything like, in school. Spoiler alert. <laughs> we never learn this stuff. Like nothing. Balance a checkbook, cash flow. I double underline cash flow. <laughs> We're going to talk about that for a second. Yeah. It's I mean, critical. I remember economics. I can't tell you one thing I took away from that class. My daughter's in high school. She's learning calculus, trigonometry, angles, and degrees of a uh, triangle. And maybe she shouldn't be watching this, but... <laughs> This is a lot of Education is important. I don't remember but. where that's come up in my day to day. Um, Cash flow is like, yes. I mean, it's, it's 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 like a lifeblood of like existence well, for a business for a person. It's, your home is your is your business. The business of the home. Your business is your business. Right. In my company, I mean, I'm very aware of cash flow. I know so many people in business who just look at cash flow in an unhealthy way. Um, and it's like, what are you, what are you thinking? Like, you, you got to pay attention to the cash flow. You're like, you got to, you get your, your, um, you got to predict and your, project and take care of the your future. risk management. Yeah. It was escaping me for a second. Like, what well, things could happen? You know, you have a line of credit. Like, should you really be maxing that out? No, it's there in case you need it. <laughs> right. I know people that take the line of credit for their business and they actually invest in the stock market. Like, if you catch it at the right time, but that's high risk. Like, what are you doing? That's not what the bank gave you the money for. <laughs> no, you know? no, for sure. So you're, what you're saying is the opposite of that. It's, it's steady, it's planning, it's thoughtfulness. Let's transition for a second into, you mentioned insurance, um, and we're still talking to these people behind the camera. This is there's a certain age group, right? I got my first insurance policy when I was like 25. I have a unique perspective. My father died when I was, when he was 42. Uh, I was 12. Wow. I grew up thinking like that's just, right. it's not normal, but it happens. So I, but most people don't have that. You should get insurance at an early age because it's so cheap. So here's, you're talking life insurance. Well, life insurance, insurance, life insurance, too, insurance is important, but what's your most valuable asset, young guys in the room, working, professionals, starting out careers, what's your most important asset right now? Is it your checkbook? Is it your hairstyle? Is it your good looks? Really? Come on. I wasn't looking at you. <laughs> it's your ability to make an income. It's your ability to work and get a paycheck. And how do you protect that if you wake up tomorrow and you don't feel good and all of a sudden 
you're diagnosed with something that affects your ability to work or if you're injured in an accident and you can't perform the way you were in your job anymore. It's not sexy. It's not even marketed. You don't see the big blimps flying overhead at the stadium promoting disability insurance. They're promoting life insurance. Why? Because life insurance is profitable to those companies. You don't pay a lot of claims for somebody young and healthy who gets a term policy for 10 and 20 years. For the most part, those people will outlive their policy. Yeah, Disability insurance, yeah, they're raking in the money. 100%. Disability insurance um, is a starting point. And disability is interesting because so I also got one of those when I was 25. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting because it's like if you become disabled from what you currently do, which is very broad. Well, you have so to have the means, right definition. Yes. So just talk have, about that for a sec. If you have a disability insurance policy, let's say you're a, uh, let's say you're a pianist or you're a neurosurgeon and you rely on your fingers to do your job. You don't want a disability insurance policy that won't pay you a benefit because you have a broad enough definition where the insurance company can say, maybe you can't play the piano, maybe you can't perform neurosurgery, but you can still sit behind a computer um, and look at a screen, or you can still use your voice, or you can still do something else and make a living. So Even they'll pay the policy and you can get a job. You wanna have an own occupation definition that if you can't perform the material duties of your specific occupation, not only will the insurance company pay you, but you're allowed to go work elsewhere and make a living. It's beautiful. And it's something that really, you're right, nobody talks about Nobody's it. teaching you that. I happened to get good guidance 25 years ago, but it's so important. Now, do you also get involved with um, the, the care that elderly people long term care long term insurance. care do you yeah. get involved with that of course talk about that because I'm sorry I, from, we live in an area where there's a lot of elderly people and so many people don't have it that should have it that should get it when they are young enough yeah. when the rates are good you're right You everybody needs that it's usually something that's anecdotal meaning you have a parent or an aunt or an uncle who at any point but typically older in age, needs care. And most people want care at home. And so they want to hire somebody to come in and help them. Um, be very expensive. Could be so expensive that you're depleting your estate. And even if you can live off of what's left, you're not leaving anything behind to your kids. Or you run out of money and now you are on Medicaid and you're forced into a facility to get that type of care. So proper planning, risk management, long-term care insurance. And there's a lot of different ways you can get it now. Um, but you talk about insurability. These are the things you take care of when you don't need them. Right. <laughs> it's counterintuitive. When you're healthy and you're insurable and you can get a policy and it's affordable, that's when you do it. Now, is this part of the difference when you're dealing with somebody who's a fiduciary this, this is all part of the conversation. It's all part of the experience. I ask a lot of questions of anybody who walks in the door. Um, it's a comprehensive financial plan versus a stock picker or an investment guy or a stock broker. Right. Um, it's a different experience. I think we're giving away the farm because <laughs> <laughs> we're probably charging less than the stock picker and we're getting your affairs in order and we're taking care of your life and we're your partner we're your coach and we're doing the right thing. I'm not going to guarantee you that we're always putting you in the right investments every day, but there's a thought process behind it. There are um, experts with years of experience that have been through the highs and lows that are putting you in this position for a reason and you will sleep at night. It's really, that's all it's all about. Okay. One more topic, college funding, college planning, that's part of your conversation. And by the way, this is not an infomercial for Jason, <laughs> but the reason for this show is, is to deliver value. And so you have such a wide variety of things that you're an expert on. So it's like we, we really are doing people justice by covering all this because people don't think about it. So if somebody watches the show 
and it, it starts a conversation and it changes somebody's life, great. If they call you, even better, but that's not what this is about. And I want you all to know that. Um, college funding is like in the middle of the two things we just talked about. There's get disability when you're young and then there's plan for old age, but in the middle there's college. What are you supposed to do? 529s, if you're in Florida, you got Florida prepaid. I mean, which way do you go? So there's different schools of thought. In terms of what we've spoken about, disability insurance comes first. Because if you can't earn a living, you have nothing to put into an investment true, plan, true. whether you're saving for college or retirement. Do not forego your retirement planning because you can't get a loan for retirement. Your child may be able to get a loan That's for a their slogan. tuition. I like that. I've never heard anybody <laughs> say that. It's true. So it's a balancing act. And when we talk about people's cash flow, we talk about what you put into your retirement plan and we put some money into the education plan. 529s, Florida prepaid plan is a form of 529. The other 529 plan has you putting money in the market. So Florida prepaid, no risk. The state of Florida guarantees tuition in a Florida school. At a flat rate, right? Regardless of what happens to inflation for tuition over the years, you're locked into today's rates. Um, you may want to supplement with the other 529 plan. What if your kid wants to go out of state? What if you want to cover things above and beyond tuition, like room and board? So there's different ways to go about it. Um, the bottom line is you got to plan ahead. You got to put some money into a plan or both of those types of plans. And, um, you know, there may be a certain element of student loans involved down the line, but don't leave yourself in a position where you haven't saved anything <laughs> for what could be very expensive for and plus so years. So many people do that. So many people do that. You really need guidance. Um, I mean, there's so many people that don't even put money aside for college. It's crazy. They don't put money aside for college. You know, I guess if you can't do it, you can't do it. But if you can do it, it's all part of this entire conversation. You know, it's you, all you've got to like, you got to do all of it. And you know, I think maybe somebody listening to this could potentially be like, wow, this is overwhelming. It's so much. It could be like, it could be scary for somebody, but that's the thing. That's why it's like, you know what? You turn to a professional, you get an advisor and they just, they can help you lay out a plan or roadmap. It's like, all right, now you just, the money will just go where it's supposed to go. You don't have to think about it. And you re every quarter, maybe revisit it, you know, whatever the plan is, but, sure. but do something. Don't sure. do, don't do nothing because time, life goes by quick. Right. Yeah. And you'll find yourself like, whoa, no disability, no life insurance. Um, not ready for college. How about no estate plan? How no estate no planning. Oh, we didn't even get into that. Uh, we need more time. <laughs> um, give me the number one, if it's even possible. Just sum, sum this up with like what, so everything that's coming, which we talked about, it's a weird time in, in history. In fact, it's repeating itself because it's like the 40s all over again. <laughs> but if you look at what happened and how we came out of that and went into another boom, like, just sit back and relax. Don't get, don't, don't be fueled by fear right now and have a plan. That's kind of what I'm taking from what you're saying. Don't panic. Don't sell out of a scary time. Don't try to time the market. If don't sell what you have, you mean you're don't, scared, but don't, don't sell what you've got. If, if you have a proper plan in place and you're invested in a scary market, do not run and hide. Do not sell out of it unless you cannot sleep at night. I've had clients in times like this who just say, I can't deal with it. And for their own mental health, we readjust the plan according to that. For everybody else, we've been through this before. We, were, we went through it in 2008. We went through it when COVID came knocking on the door just a few years ago. Is this a recession? Maybe. Will we get through it? Yes. Will it happen overnight? Maybe not. But when we come out of it, every time when we come out of it, we come out of it much stronger than we were when we went into it. And you do not want to miss out on that opportunity. And that that is the truth. And that is the key. It, it's it's always a cycle. It's always a cycle. I mean, you mentioned um, 
COVID, I mean, that, that, that opportunity, if you went in when everybody else was coming out, you had a pretty good couple of, was a good two years. In particular, if you went into the places where people um, all of a sudden found themselves at home, <laughs> doing work at home, logging into Netflix at home, yeah, using their computers, as you know, more than ever, um, those stay-at-home stocks went on a nice ride, but you had to know what to get out of them. <laughs> I mean, what was it? Uh, um, Zoom. I mean, it went up, but like, what just happened to it? <laughs> what happened to it was, here's a company that thrived during a pandemic, but if you really analyze the fundamentals long-term, where were they going to end up when people ultimately did go back into the office? So you have to predict both sides of it. And there's no, and you can't predict. No. So it goes back to diversification and Correct. risk management. Correct. And um, man, it's, it's, it's so much. Oh, listen, I want to thank you for, uh, for coming out today. No, this to me was to fun. Me. <laughs> it, likewise, it was fun because it's such an interesting topic, you know, and, and the, the first part of your story is like, is like, uh, you know, people don't live their dreams usually. And so the fact that you got to do that, you made it happen. And you are totally that guy. Yep. <laughs> I have no regrets. Yeah. I mean, you have like the perfect demeanor to be that guy. It's been, it's, uh, you, you should, you need to go back on TV. <laughs> um, can you do Marv Albert? No. <laughs> That'll can, be the next can you podcast. Do impressions? <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, thank, thank you for, uh, for coming on. Um, I hope that somebody watches this and that they take something from it, you know, and that we, we did help somebody. And that's really the point of doing the show. Um, either you nor I get anything from this. It's just about, you know, paying it forward. You know, that's what it comes down to. And you got to have a drink. There's going to be another one too, if you want to hang out. <laughs> um, so, you know, you are a humble guy. And I love, I love when I can finish up the show and, and share that you are humble. Um, and oftentimes <clears throat> you meet people that are successful, that have built something, you know, that are financially successful that are not so humble, but I love when people come on and, and, and you just have that like down to earth, humble energy. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's awesome because that makes it easy to work with you. And, and it's, um, it's a staple of this show. So uh, being, you know, working hard, being humble and, and just hustling. That's yeah. what it's about. That's what it's about. That's how we do the show. So awesome. Thank you so much for coming on before we end the show. If you want, if you want to, you can share your information. Look into this camera. Uh, where can we find you? If you want to give your email, you know, social sure. media, feel free. Thanks. So Jason Solotkin, uh, our, I guess the, the best way to reach me is, is by email. And it's Jason, J-A-S-O-N, at FDR, the old president, FDR Group, Inc., I-N-C dot com, or just call the office, 954-961. 5333. The website is fdrgroupinc.com. Just look us up. That's it. So remember, do the work, hustle, you'll reach your potential. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Now that it's COVID, we got to do these. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Thanks again. Awesome.